Welcome to the first lesson of um, 211, oh, sorry, welcome to the first grade lesson of 10 Ables. Science, um, we are doing vectors in 2D. I've decided that we should start right at the beginning of the year because this is effectively a revision lesson. Before I start, I'd like to suggest that you guys all join the 2 Able website and join the grade 11 physical science class. The reason I'd say that is because that gives you an opportunity to, that gives you an opportunity to message me and also it gives you the ability to access all the multitudes of free resources in the Turnable platform. Right, let's get started straight away with vectors into dimensions. So remember that this is revision. So we first we start off with talking just about what are vectors and scalars. Everything we measure can be divided into two groups, whether they be scalars or vectors. Scalar is a physical quantity that is magnitude only, it's how big it is, and has a unit but no direction. In other words, we say how far it has gone, but not how what direction, okay? So in other words, if I said to you, I walked five kilometers, that's wonderful, but if I said that I walked five kilometers up a mountain, that would be more impressive. So a scalar has got no direction. A vector is a physical quantity that has both magnitude and direction. So it represents the force vector, while F represents the magnitude of the force. The okay, so in other words, what we can do is we could say, if I said to you that we have got six newtons, then this year, another way of writing it is six with an arrow at the top. And that would say that that is a vector. And a vector always has magnitude and direction. And that direction can be left or it can be right. It can be east. It can be west. Okay, anything like that. So you guys need to be able to tell the difference between vectors and scalars. And for that reason, I have tabulated it. Okay, so distance, we've spoken about it already. So if I, distance and displacement are both measured in SI units and your SI units are meters. The difference again with this lot is that they have direction direction. Mass is measured in kilograms, whereas weight is the force with which the earth attracts or whatever planet is attracts the object. Okay, and that is measured in newtons. Speed and velocity have the same units, but again, SI units of meters per second, but velocity, again, you need a direction. Time is in seconds. And remember, that's a scalar because as of yet, we cannot go back in time. Acceleration, now acceleration is defined as the change in velocity, the change in velocity, okay, over the change in time, the change in velocity over the change in time, and that's acceleration. And the electric charge is going to be coulombs, and the electric charge is also a scalar. So those are examples of scalars and vectors, and you guys need to be able to identify the different scalars and vectors. Now, representing vectors. We represent vectors using an arrow. If we have a very big arrow, then it is a big vector. And if we have a small arrow, then it is a small vector. Small vector, okay? The direction of the vector is also indicated by the arrow. So in this case, both the vectors are saying that they're going in an easterly direction, or we can say that they're going to the right. Okay, easterly direction, or we can say that they're going to the right. And 
We must remember just one other thing. When you're drawing vectors, please use a ruler and a pencil. Please use a ruler and a pencil. It is very important that we do that, okay? If we don't draw, use a ruler and a pencil, we will not be able to draw this accurately. I, unfortunately, as software, don't have the ability to use a ruler, so that's not possible for me. Now, direction of vectors. There are three ways to represent the direction of a vector. You can use a compass, you can look at bearings, and you can talk about the direction of a vector relative to another vector. Right, so if we use a compass, a compass is basically showing the four points on a compass, right? So they are north, south, east, and west. And if some of people say they get confused, I tend to help help people by saying that if you think about it, they read, read we, okay, there's we. So it's north, south, east, and west. And there are other points on the campus, and if you do geography, you'll know about northwest, southwest, and everything else, but generally in science, we don't worry about them. We only worry about the four cardinal points. And what we do is we measure a vector with respect to one of these cardinal points. So for example, this would be saying that we got 30 degrees north of east. In other words, we add east, and then we're measuring up 30 degrees. Okay, or we've got 30 degrees east of south. In other words, from the south, we are going across by 30 degrees. Okay, so we're 30 degrees east of south. Let's look at this one. Yeah, we are talking about bearings. Now, this is very important because this is different from maths, okay? Maths goes the other way. Math starts here, naught degrees. So if you're doing trigonometry, you have got naught 90, 180, 270, and back to 360. Science is different in that they decided that the North Pole was North degrees, the South Pole was 180 degrees, the East was 90, and the West was 270, okay? So, if you look at this, you see that we are, again, 30 degrees, and a bearing of 60 degrees is 30 degrees North of east. That's exactly the same bearing that we had before. However, if we are doing bearings, we always measure clockwise from zero. We measure clockwise from zero. So therefore, we say that this is on a bearing of 60 degrees. It's on a bearing of 60 degrees. Okay? Yeah, we've got a bearing of 210 degrees. So what is that saying? We know that that gap there is 30 degrees, okay? Because 210 minus 30 gives you 180 degrees. So this is a bearing of 210 degrees, okay? Bearing of 210 degrees, which means that we are going from north all the way around by 210 degrees. Right, in each of these cases, these cases here that I'm drawing, or that the computer is drawing, the vector angle between A and B is 30 degrees. The vector angle between A and B is 30 degrees. The direction of the vector is always measured at the tail of the vector. So we're always going from the tail across by 30 degrees, from the tail across by 30 degrees, from the tail across by 30 degrees. Okay, so these are vectors that are measuring the direction relative to another vector. So let's talk about adding vectors. So a typical example of adding vectors in when we when we're just looking for displacement. So if we're talking about one dimension, we're only talking about 
one direction okay we're not talking about the boy band we're talking about the fact that we're going in one direction one dimension so it says a boy walks here's your boy he walks 14 meters east and then he walks a further 10 meters east so he walks 14 meters east and then a further 10 meters east okay find his resultant displacement well it's pretty obvious from this diagram that the resultant vector the resultant displacement is 24 meters but what you need to understand is what we are doing here is we're applying we're applying a, actually a very important mathematical and scientific equation and that is that we know that the force resultant the resultant force or better still resultant displacement in this case resultant or the resultant vector is always the sum of all the vectors it's always the sum of all the vectors so what's important is remember we said that vectors have got direction okay and although I said one dimension is one direction, you need to understand that when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the fact that you can either go, we're talking about in the same line, okay? So yeah, we're traveling 14 meters east and then a further 10 meters east. 14 meters east and then a further 10 meters east, okay? So we do you agree that we're moving in the same direction? So because of that, I can let east be positive. I'm going to decide that east is positive. Then my resultant displacement, now you might think I'm really going overboard with this, but there's a reason for it. It gets more complicated as we go through things. So let's do it to the basic stuff. And then if we start with the basic stuff, then when we get to the more complicated stuff, then it'll be very easy. So the resultant displacement is going to be 14 plus another positive 10 because it's in the same direction. And then it becomes 14, a plus times a plus is a plus 10, which is 24 meters. Whereas here, you've got a lady and she is basically walks 20 meters east and then she walks another seven meters west 20 meters east and then a seven meters west and they say find the displacement that's what they want to know remember displacement you're hoping you know this is that dis basically how far you are from where you started how far you are from where you started okay so 20 meters and 7 meters back okay 20 meters 7 meters back but now if we follow this rule here we're letting the 20 meters be positive which means the 7 meters or the west is going to be negative. So if we had to write this as a sum, okay, we've got displacement, result of displacement is equal to 20 meters plus negative 7, which equals 14 meters. Why? Actually, that's 13, sorry, because that's 20 plus times a minus is a minus 7, which is 13 meters. So the resultant displacement is 13 meters. But what's important with both these answers that I haven't put in? I haven't put the direction in. Okay, you have to always put the direction in. So this one, we would say it is 24 meters east. And over here, we see that the final answer is 13 meters. Okay, now this seems pretty obvious again from a sketch and from the fact that it's an easy question, that when we say 13 meters, we're saying 13 meters east. 13 meters east, okay? Why do we know it's east? Because it's a positive number. And we said that east was positive. Now let's talk about adding nonlinear vectors. So we've spoken about adding linear vectors. Now let's talk about adding nonlinear 
vectors. So if we add nonlinear vectors, do you agree that we need something other than just the basic, basic straight line that we spoke about earlier? And there are three, there are two methods. Well, we can use two methods, okay? They've, I've written down three, and the reason I've ignored it is because we don't generally use a polygon method. These are the two methods that you guys tend to use. You use the triangle method or the parallelogram method. The polygon method is only used when you've got multiple vectors. So I will explain this to you and you may come across this polygon method in a test or two, but when you get to grade 11 and 12, you won't really have to use the polygon method. You only need to learn to use the triangle and the parallelogram method. So the triangle method is called the tail to head method or the head to tail method. The head to tail or tail to head method, it totally depends on your textbook and who's teaching you. So when you look at a vector, this here is the tail and this here is the head. Okay, head to tail. So if we look at our vector, there is a vector, okay, V1, and we've got a second vector, V2, our resultant would be to join from the tail to this to the head of that, the head of the arrow. So you'll notice that we're going from the head to the tail, and then Basically, whenever we're drawing our vectors, the only vector that is not head to tail is the resultant. So this would be our resultant vector. Okay, and the resultant is always the sum of all the vectors. So it's the effective value of the two vectors taken together. So if we had to do this, we need to use some mathematical calculations and you need to know a bit about Pythagoras and you need to know a little bit about simple trig ratios. So let me just give this to you. If you have a right angle triangle, okay, do you remember that if this is X, or let's, sorry, let's make this Y and this is X, then this side here is the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse can be given as the square root of x squared plus y squared, and that is Pythagoras' theorem, that the hypotenuse is the square root of x squared plus y squared, okay? The hypotenuse is the square root of x squared plus y squared. We can also use simple trig ratios. So, I'm hoping that you guys know Sarka or your teacher may have taught you silly old hens, cackle and howl till old age. It doesn't matter what you got taught, as long as you know that sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cos of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, tan of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. Okay, so this is the hypotenuse. If I choose this to be theta, then do you agree that this side is the adjacent side and this side is the opposite side? It's the opposite side to the angle and the adjacent is the side next to the angle. So this is the adjacent and this is the opposite, right? And what you need to realize is that this is what we're talking about. Sine theta is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Cos theta is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And tan theta is opposite over adjacent. Opposite over adjacent. So let's do an example. It says a girl walks due west for a distance of 50 meters and then 30 meters due south. It says calculate her resultant displacement. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to 
draw it, okay? So we say a girl walks due west, okay? So just to make sure you guys know where I am, this is north, south, west, and east. So the girl walks due west for a distance of 50 meters. She then walks due south for a distance of 30 meters. And they want to know what is her resultant displacement. And that is her resultant displacement over there. What is her resultant displacement? Now remember that this is a vector. So you need to work out both magnitude and you have to work out direction, magnitude and direction. Okay, this is obviously a right angle because if that is west and that is south, then that is 90 degrees. So we can obviously use Pythagoras' theorem to work out this length here. So we can say R is equal to the square root of 50 squared plus 30 squared, okay? which equals the square root of, and now what we're going to do is we're going to get out a calculator. So just hang on a second. There is my calculator. Okay, it might look a bit different from your calculator, but it all works the same. And we're going to switch it on. Now we want the square root of 50 squared plus 30 squared. So we're going to go square root of 50 squared plus 30 squared and then we're going to go equals and that doesn't really give you an answer that we can use I'm going to write it in actually yeah I'm going to write it in so it becomes 10 square root 34 but is that a number we can use if I said to you guys please go walk the square root of 34 meters could you do that for me not really not very easy so what we need to do is we need to convert it so what you do is you look for your SD button and you press that and it tells you 58.3095 so it equals 58,3095 meters but that's not a good answer either. Why is that not a good answer? Because in science, we always round off to two decimal places. Two decimal places. Two decimal places. So this becomes 58,31 meters. 58,31 meters. Right. Have I finished the sum? No, I haven't, because we need to know the direction. And there are a couple of ways we can do direction, but the easiest way to do direction is always to do bearing from north. So in order to do the bearing, which is the direction of the resultant from north, I need to work out this little angle here, because this angle, this distance here, from here all the way around, is obviously 180 degrees. So if I work out this little angle, then obviously I can add it to the 180 degrees, and then I have my whole bearing around, okay? So then I could tell you what the resultant was. So there are a couple ways you can do this. You can either work out that angle and then subtract it from 90, or you can work out this angle and realize that it's alternate, alternate to that angle. So if we work out this angle, okay, then we have that angle. So let's do this. I'm going to call this X, okay? So now we need our soccer toa. Soccer toa, okay? And I would like to suggest to you that unless it's, unless it is, unless you have to, use a resultant or number that you've worked out, like the 58.31. I would suggest that you always try and use the values that they gave you, the values that they gave you, okay? So, they gave me the 30 and they gave me the 50. Why did I say that? Because just now you made a mistake. Say you worked this out perfectly, but you made a silly mistake on the calculator or in rounding, and you end up with 59.31 or 58.2 or something silly. Then you're going to carry that error over, okay? And that would be bad. A better solution 
would be to use the numbers that they gave you. So we are going to use a 30 and the 50. So if we look at this angle here, X, we can see that 30 is the adjacent side and 50 is the opposite side. Okay, 50 is the opposite side. Right, so then obviously I'm looking at using the tan function. So I can say tan X is equal to the opposite, which is 50, over the adjacent, which is 30. So therefore we can say X is equal to the second function of 50 over 30. So we're going to pop that in our calculators. We're going to get the calculator out and we're going to move it over. We're going to clear it. And we're going to go shift tan. Now you always use shift tan when you find in the angle. And then we're going to use the fraction button and we're going to go 50 and then we're going to go down and then we're going to go 30 and then we're going to go across and we're going to close the bracket and say equals. And we got 59.04. Now before I move this calculator, I really want you to look at this big D here. That D stands for decimal. And you really need to make sure that your calculator has the D and not a big G or a big R. Because they stand for radians and other types of mathematical measurements for angles. And if you have those, then your exam is going to be wrong. Your question is going to be wrong. You have to be working in decimals. So please make sure it's there. If it's not, most of your calculators have a reset button at the back. You just need to press it or you need to go into your mode and your setup and find it and change it back to decimals, not to radians. Okay, so we've worked out that this angle is 59.036. Okay, so X equals 59,036, which is 59,04 degrees. Okay, but please remember now that this is just this angle here, and we need to do the total bearing from north, the total bearing from north. So therefore, the total bearing is 180 degrees plus 59,04, which is 04,9352, So my final answer would be 58,31 meters on a bearing of 239,04 degrees. Right, now let's look at adding vectors using the parallelogram method. Now in the old curriculum they used to make it a rule that you had to know the parallelogram method and they could either ask you to solve a question using the triangle method or the parallelogram method. Nowadays they don't do that. They just say to you, find the displacement. And it's up to you to decide whether you want to use the triangle method or the parallelogram method. And there's some cases where the parallelogram method is actually much easier to use than the triangle method. So let's have a look at the parallelogram method. This is known as a tail to tail method. Vectors are drawn tail to tail and the parallelogram is completed and the resultant is determined. So let me show an example. We've got a girl who walks 100 meters due east before turning and walking a distance of 50 meters in a direction 60 degrees south of east. Determine her resultant displacement. So We've got a girl who walks 100 meters due east before turning and walking a distance of 50 meters in the direction of east, six, east 60 degrees east, south, which means that it is 60 degrees south of east. That's how you read this. This is read as 60 degrees south of east. 
Okay. Now it's very important when you draw your triangles and when you draw your parallelogram that you actually use a ruler. Now again, I stress to you guys that I do not have a ruler in my facility in, in this whole PowerPoint thing that I'm doing. So I can't do that, but you guys really need to use a ruler and you need to draw with a pencil. So a girl walks 100 meters east. So she walks 100 meters east. Okay, and then she walks another 50 meters at 60 degrees south of east. So she walks this way, 60 degrees south of east. But this is the head to tail method, the head to tail method. I want to show you how to draw it using the tail to tail, the tail to tail. So let's draw it over here. Yeah, we've got the girl walking 100 meters due east, 100 meters due east. She's walking then 60 degrees south of east, 60 degrees south of east for 50 meters. And we want the resultant. So this is how the parallel parallelogram method works. What we are going to do is we're going to complete the parallelogram. We are going to draw a line parallel to this line at the end of this, and we are going to draw it a hundred meters long or the same length. You actually have to measure this and make sure it's the same length. Then we're going to join these lines and these lines should be parallel. This line should be parallel with this line and it should be 50 meters. And then what we're going to do, do is join the start and the finish. So we're going to start, join the start here, and we're going to work it out there, and we're going to measure that. And that is the resultant. And that is the resultant. Okay, so this is how we would determine her resultant displacement. Now, the only way you can do this at your stage of trigonometry using your um, parallelogram method is drawing a scale diagram, is drawing a scale diagram because you haven't done enough maths yet to be able to do this. You haven't learned the cos rule or the sine rule yet. Actually, you may have learned the sine rule and cos rule by now because it's June. Okay, so let's talk about those rules. The sine rule says A over sine A equals B over sine b equals c over sine c or vice versa. You can draw these both ways. The cos rule says a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. Right, now we obviously want to work out the third side, which would be the resultant. And we also need to work out an angle, okay, to be able to do this. But we've got one angle. This angle here is 60 degrees. So we now we need to decide if we want to use a sine rule or if we want to use the cos rule. So in order to use the sine rule, we obviously either use A over sine A, B over sine B, or C over sine C um, with each other. So in other words, we either use the first two together or the second two together or the first and the third. We don't use them all together, okay? So if we look at this, okay, we have got 100 here, 50 here, and we've got this angle here. So do you agree that I could use the sine rule to get another angle, okay? I could say, that this is 60 degrees, this is 100 and that is 50. We need that side over there. So I'm just looking at the time. Sorry, I suddenly thought that maybe I needed to leave the lesson, but I've just realized that the time is still fine. Okay, right. Or we could use the cos rule, but the cos rule is used for when you've got an enclosed angle. The rule is that the cos rule 
is when we've got an enclosed angle. We've got two sides, an enclosed angle. That's the cos rule. So we know that this angle here is 60 degrees. We know that we've got the, this side is 100. We know that that's 50 and we've got that angle C. So could we possibly use the cos rule to work out this side here R? I think we could because we've got this 60 degrees. We've got big A. I mean, that's big A, that's little a, that's B, we want C. Oh, it's going to be a complicated question. Okay, I actually think that this is a little bit beyond you doing it the parallelogram method. You guys would have to draw a scale diagram. So what you would do is you would actually measure out, for example, that this is 10 centimeters okay and that would represent the hundred meters yeah you would measure out that this is five centimeters and that would have to be to scale obviously okay but that would represent the 50 and obviously this would be the rest of your parallelogram and then you would measure using your ruler and you would measure that there and you would find that that would have to be bigger than both the 10 and the 5 and I'd like to challenge you to do this do this question and I will go through it I will draw it out neatly I'll scan it and and I will show you the solution to this in the next lesson and we'll see if you got it right okay remember that this is 60 degrees if you can do it mathematically that's great but I'm a little bit concerned that you guys may not have got to this point in the trick so you would have to do it in the scale diagram in the science section so try that for me and I will go through it nice and slowly and I will do a scale diagram and show you guys how to do that for the next lesson. Right, let's talk about components of vectors. Any vector can be broken up into its components in any direction, okay? So in other words, if we have a vector that is going in this direction, we can break it up into its easterly and northerly components, or we could break it up into its westerly and southerly components. A component is the effective value of a vector in a particular given direction. In other words, that vector there, that vector there can be made up of going east this way and north that way, or it can be made up with going west that way and south that way. Right. So if, for example, we had to look at a flight of stairs, we know that stairs work like this. Okay, stairs work like this. So if I said to you, what is the resultant vector? Do you agree that I'd say, well, I started here and I draw a straight line and I end here. So that is my resultant vector. But basically what I'm saying is that it can be broken up into its component northerly and southerly, well, in this case is actually easterly and northerly or we could say that this is going right and this is going up so those would be its components but what you need to understand and this is very important is that these are also components of that vector so if we had to add up all of these little vertical vectors it would equal to the same as the sum of that up, okay? And if we had to add all of these up, right? We would equal all of that, right? Everybody understand that? Okay, right, let's move on. Vectors can be resolved into several pairs of components in any directions. So for example, we could take our vector A and we could break it into a pair of components like that, or a pair of components like that, or we could even draw another one that goes straight across like this and then vertically up as well. So to solve any problem, 
we now take just the horizontal and vertical components because of the fact that we could do this and go like that or we could do that and go like that to solve the problem instead of doing that we always just use horizontal and vertical components so let's talk about resolving vectors into components by calculation there is a vector okay that is its vertical component and that is its horizontal component and that is 90 degrees the whole point is that the horizontal and vertical components are always perpendicular to each other they always are at 90 degrees so what that means is we can use trigonometry so if i said to you that this is theta then we'd know that this is the resultant so again we could use what we could use our trig and we could use sa ka toa so let's say i want to work out the vertical component of the resultant do you agree that the resultant is the hypotenuse and you need to understand that the hypotenuse hypot hypotenuse is always the resultant okay or the it's actually the vector we're trying to find the components of this is the horizontal component which is adjacent to the angle and this is the vertical component which is opposite to the angle opposite to the angle now if i want to work out the vertical component the vertical component do you agree that i would need to use the opposite and the hypotenuse because that is what i've been given i've been given this this was my vector i need to find the components of so i need to use sine so i would say that sine theta is equal to the opposite which is the vertical component over my vector which i'm going to call r so do you agree then that the vertical component is we just multiply that across the vertical component is equal to r sine theta okay now we can also work out the horizontal component the horizontal component is the adjacent side and again i'm going to use that part and use because that's what i was given so i'm going to use cos so i'm going to say well cos theta is equal to the horizontal over r so therefore r cos theta is equal to the horizontal side r cos theta is equal to the horizontal side okay and that's as far as we are going to go for this lesson today please i urge you to go and try that question it's this question whoopsie hang on let me go back it's this question oh it's going to take forever there it no there it is i urge you to go and try this question i promise that before i start the next lesson i will come back to this question and i will have done a nice beautiful scale diagram of this and show you what the actual answer is right please have a wonderful day and i hope you will join me on thursday for a continuation of this lesson bye